So, welcome Jack Albritton to Raw and Cook Vegan. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Uh, so, I, tell me first, Jack, a little bit about growing up for you. What was your family's orientation in terms of diet and fitness, that sort of thing? Well, I grew up in um, Alabama, so, uh, you know, I grew up on a lot of the su typical southern foods. Um, looking back, I had a kind of, I guess I got a good base as a kid for this lifestyle, even though I was overweight. I mean, we ate, we ate, a, we ate a lot of the traditional stuff. I mean, I did eat fried food. I did eat heavier foods, but we didn't try everything like the typical southerners do. Um, my grandparents had a garden, and, um, you know, in the south, there's... Um, farmers and road stands everywhere. So, you know, even from a very early age, we would eat heavy vegetables in the summer, you know, any black eyed peas, turnip greens, corn, fresh vegetables. But, of course, I ate the heavy, you know, you go to church socials and you go to this and that, and I did eat the heavy stuff. I ate the fried chickens and, uh, you know, the heavy cakes and the heavy casseroles with sauces. So, I did grow up on a fairly standard American diet. Okay. Okay. And how would you characterize your health growing up? Uh, my health was good growing up. I was, I would say I was an overweight kid until about the fifth or sixth grade. And then one summer I just kind of decided I didn't want to be the fat kid anymore. And um, I lost like 20 pounds in a summer. So that was between like my sixth and seventh grade year. Obviously not really knowing a lot, you know, just kind of cutting back on calories, cutting some of the bad things out, and just getting more exercise. Did you do that with the help of your parents, or did you just do that on your own? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is back, I'm 50 years old, so we're talking back, you know, in the, in the 70s. Um, my mother, like I say, she was overweight also, but she tried. You know, she knew about vegetables and getting fresh fruit, and so, yeah, she you know, as much as she knew back then, she kind of guided me a little bit. And, um, you know, it wasn't anything radical or drastic, like I stopped eating. It was just like, you know, cutting out things like cutting out the breads, cutting out the sweets that I had been eating, cutting out the sugar, just eating smaller portions. But, you know, there was nothing drastic. And I played okay. golf, okay. so I walked. So I got a lot of exercise. All right. All right. Um, before we continue, Jack, let me ask you, are, is this a laptop that you're working on? Uh, yes. Can you tilt the uh, the camera a little bit so that I've got a lot of space above your head? Maybe we could see a little more of your torso. There you go. Just just a yeah. I still want to see the top of your head a little. Yeah, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks, man. That's good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's All good. Right. Um, so let's let's get into this now. So your first thing is you kind of on your own lost about 20 pounds in the fifth grade, which is impressive in itself, I think. And then at what age did you start to look at diet a little more a little more in depth than just in terms of calories? Oh, gosh, that probably came, whew, that probably came when I was grown in my 30s because when I was in university, once I lost weight and got into high school, I was kind of a, I wasn't a, a team sports player, so I hit the gym. And I started working out, and I got I got pretty big in college. I was about 245 pounds at six two. Ah. Ah. I wasn't a bodybuilder. I looked like a big football player. And, and looking back, I knew nothing about you know we didn't know anything back then. I would uh, and I had atrocious habits in college. I'd go to the gym. I could bench press 350 pounds, but you know I'd go out on the weekend and drink a case of beer and bring home two pounds of steak and cook them at two o'clock in the morning after a party yeah. night. So. You know, back then it was just more of a mentality of like, just just put anything in your body and go to the gym, and you'll make and you'll make yourself big. Was there an emphasis on protein? Oh yeah, of course. You know, always eating the cans of protein um, for extra, and you know, plenty of meat and fish and, and chicken and stuff. Um, All right. And, and how would you characterize your health in those college years? Remarkably well, you know, for the way that I mistreated myself for so many years, I actually came to this lifestyle in pretty decent health. I've never been a sickly person. I've never been one prone to sickness uh, my whole life. Okay. Uh, I've, you know, I've been, I've been knock on wood. I've enjoyed very good health my entire life. All right. Hang on one. Hang on one sec, Jack. So, 
um, you so you kind of were blessed with good health. You never ran into any issues. So what was it that brought about your interest in in veganism, or or did you at first become vegetarian? Did you were you into the ethical side of things? What what happened? No, it was just one thing led to another. About it was in January of 2012. I had been I'd gotten back into drinking pretty hard again. I was just living pretty bad. Uh, I moved from the beach in Costa Rica to the city and was for a period there living on fried chicken and fried food and beer and I just uh, I don't know I just finally got to a point where I knew that if I didn't do something about the drinking and get off the heavy drinking that it was you know I was going to have cirrhosis uh, some sort of cancer so I decided to lose some weight start living a little bit more healthy and just one thing led to another you know I was I was actually in pretty clean and in pretty good shape when I found out about raw veganism. In fact, I refer to in a lot of my videos that I did my transition without knowing that I was doing a transition. <laughs> because I had been, I, when I got on the path of just getting healthier, I was doing mostly fruit and smoothies. I was pretty much, without not knowing it, uh, I was doing raw before from the very beginning because I was eating a lot of fruits, a lot of smoothies, a lot of salads during the day. And then I was eating, I was still eating some meat, some dairy at the time, but it was fairly healthy in the evenings. And then about six months into that, I, you know, it's just one of those 10 degrees of separation that you have on the internet. Can't tell you how I got there. One Saturday afternoon, I was, uh, you know, I probably went to somebody's Facebook profile. They had shared a link. I clicked on this link, went somewhere else, clicked and went somewhere from that. And before I know it, I had gotten to YouTube and was watching some videos on, um, the raw vegan lifestyle. All right. And I'll, I'll say this, like from that very first day, it made sense. Um, from the very first um, raw vegan video that I watched, I can't say I did things perfectly. I made a lot of mistakes, but I was vegan from that moment. I've never had, um, knowingly had any animal products since then. Okay. Okay. Now, somehow I'd gotten the impression that you, you had been this way for like 10 or 20 years, but I guess, I guess I was mistaken. So this is since like, 2012, 2013? Yeah, I started, you know, I did, like I said, I started cleaning up, started my journey like in uh, January of 2012, and I actually went high raw vegan in about mid-June of 2012. Okay. All right. And what were some of the uh, obstacles that you ran into when you, when you made this transition, if there were any? Um... I didn't, I wouldn't say I really had any obstacles per se. I did things, you know, I was, um, I was living in the city. I lived by myself. I was able to work from home. I didn't have to get out very much, which offered me a lot of time to study and research on this. Um, I will tell you, I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning because my stomach naturally starts shrinking anyway when I just, um, started getting healthier. You know, it wasn't like I was, trying to restrict per se, but that was what I always knew, you know, like when you started getting healthier, you cut back. And I kind of just got to a point where um, I was just lightheaded all the time. I wasn't eating near enough. I'm six foot two and I got down to a low of 143 pounds. And, and it got to where almost every time I stood up, I had to steady myself or I felt like I was going to, you know, fall one of these times. So I went through a lot of um, malnutrition in the beginning. And, you know, I kind of did some bouncing after that. I said uh, I overcompensated by eating more cooked food and more fats, you know, just get some calories in there. But yeah, yeah. as far as obstacles go, you know, I, didn't, I don't have much of a social life, so I didn't have, like, a whole lot of things that were holding me back. I kind of took to it, you know, almost from the beginning. Okay. okay. And I should have asked you earlier, are you living permanently in Costa Rica now? Yeah, I've been down here for 15 years now. Wow, and if you don't mind, tell us how that came about, because uh, is, is it easy to, are, are you now a citizen of Costa Rica? How does that affect your American citizenship, that sort of thing? Now, I, there's, I have lots of friends. I just have never, you know, I'm kind of a vagabond. I've never really put down deep roots here. Um, I'm what's called a perpetual tourist, um, which means I have to get, leave the country every three months for my visa. Okay. Um, now... What I used to do, sometimes I would just hop across the border and do a little bit, mini vacations in Nicaragua. Um, but 
my mother's 84 years old now, so I go. It's a good. It's a good excuse for me to go back to the states every three months and see how she's doing. Anyway. Gotcha. gotcha. And uh, my understanding is that Costa Rica is um, kind of unique in a way compared to some of the other uh, other countries in the vicinity, in that there there is quite a bit of uh, foreign representation there, right? A lot of folks going down there from from the United States and other countries. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's, um, in fact, that's probably what's held me back. I feel kind of self-conscious that after 15 years, I'm not fluent in Spanish. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I can get by better, better than the average gringo down here, but really in the, in the beach town where I live, you could live here for the rest of your life and not speak a word of Spanish. So, yeah, there's a very heavy North American um, and European influence down here. All right. All right. Okay, so... When you made this transition and initially you kind of felt like you were losing too much weight, were, were you trying to get most of your calories from vegetables? Was were you just were you eating fruit but not enough? What what was going on? Yeah, I think I, I just wasn't pounding that fruit in. You know, back even in those early days, I look back now with the bananas that I eat and laugh. I thought, you know, I guess you have to build up and get used to this lifestyle. I would eat sometimes, you know, eight or nine bananas in a day, and I thought, wow. I've just killed yeah. it on business today. And, uh, yeah, you know, just looking back, it was just, it, like I said, it wasn't drastic. And one thing that probably kept me from feeling it more is, and I do that now, I have a habit. I don't really sit and eat at any one time. I kind of graze. I eat all day long. So even back then, you know, I wasn't eating enough, but I was eating intermittently enough to where I just wasn't, I wasn't hungry. So I didn't have the hunger to tell me, okay, you need to eat more. And, yeah, basically, I just was not getting near enough calories. And I was doing, um, you know, salads in the evening with not a lot of fat. I wasn't very high fat from the very beginning. So, yeah, that was just the whole thing. I would, do, I would guesstimate that I was probably in the beginning there only getting maybe 1,200 calories a day. Okay, and yeah. Was, yeah. And um, yeah. what's your take on fitness? Are you... Are you getting out and doing physical activity, or are you mostly doing intellectual work? What what what's that like? Um, I have a I practice yoga, and I practice a very um, I practice a whole a holistic version of yoga, which includes you know more than just what is the, the physical part. But yeah, I do practice asanas. Um, I do yoga. I I'm trying to get back into some other forms of fitness, but. I've been so into yoga for the last six months or so that um, I put off doing other things just because I don't want it to interfere. In other words, uh, you know, I don't want to be sore when I go to my yoga classes. But I do yeah, notice yeah. I need to get some cardio in there, and I need to get back to a little bit of resistance training. Uh, would you characterize the yoga as, is it kind of like Ashtanga Vinyasa or different than that? It's a, it's a Vinyasa flow. My teacher is an Ashtangi. Um, and she does she does incorporate a lot of elements of Ashtanga in it. I mean, it's a difficult class. I mean, I've actually had to pull back a little bit on it lately because five days a week was just too much for me. It's a very intense class. Yeah. All right. Interesting. So um, it's it's cool that you've had this experience, kind of working your way through the best form of a, a raw vegan diet. Would you, would you say now are you 100% raw? Do you st you eat some cooked foods? What's your take on that? Um, I am like, I'm mostly raw. I, well, I'm, for the last nine months or a year, kind of, I measure my things in my three month periods that I'm in Costa Rica. I'm, you know, except for maybe some nuts that could be cooked or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm 100% raw when I'm in Costa Rica. And then I play around. I eat cooked food when I go to visit my mom in Alabama. But I stay, I stay pretty clean. I mean, I get a little, I get a little heavier and I eat, there's a few, um, exception meals that I go a little higher on the fat but I definitely stay vegan and I stay pretty clean but I do I do eat a fair amount of cooked food when I'm up stateside. Do you notice any effects either way in terms of health or performance when you are incorporating cooked food and when you're not? You know I, t I, I try to include a lot of um, the, the people that eat cooked food on my site so I talk about this a lot I can't really make um, a fair comparison to other people eating cooked food because I eat it so rarely that 
I tend to overdo. Like, in other words, I, I, I feel like I get sluggish. It brings me down. But then again, since I don't eat potatoes very much, I'll eat a, when I go to the States, I'll eat a bag of five-pound potatoes in one city. <laughs> and, and some of those times when I'm eating the cook, you know, I'm putting some oil in there, which when I'm at home here, I don't, I don't ever eat oil. I don't add oil to anything. So yeah. Yeah. I'm going back to the States in uh, like the week before Christmas. And uh, I actually kind of have, I want to experiment a little bit on that trip. I'm going to try to eat some just like normal, clean, cooked meals, but a little bit more balanced, like something would maybe be like, you know, a portion of quinoa, a portion of vegetables and a salad or a yeah, potato, yeah. Uh, vegetables and a salad. And I kind of want to see how that compares. That's a great point. I love that, Jack. Um, and would you say, tell us a little bit about fruit availability in Costa Rica throughout the year. Oh, God, this is, this is the promised land. There's, uh, you know, there's fruit. There's fruit all the time. You know, when I went to the States last month, I thought the mango season was just about over. And I get back down here, and I just think you're going absolutely crazy on mango the last uh, two weeks. I mean, I've been eating more mango than I can, uh, than I can put in my mouth hardly. And, uh, you know, mangoes, to- mangoes are so good, and uh, you, there's such an emphasis on bananas. I, I, was, uh, I found it interesting. I think a mango has about 200 calories. So you could eat you could eat uh, five or six mangoes, and that's a pretty solid you know that's a thousand calories. Yeah. And um, and a little little more water content than a banana. So yeah, I, I love mangoes. That was one of my that was something that you know like I say I always plan to kind of improve a little bit when I'm coming back after one of my trips, and that's something that was on the agenda is to get more variety in there because I get busy sometimes with my work and just day-to-day and projects I'm on and um, sometimes I just have all I have time for is bananas and orange juice. I mean, luckily I have a good source for fresh squeezed orange juice, but, you know, I kind of want to, I think there's a lot of good stuff here and I need to take advantage of it. So since I've been back, I've been eating a ton of mangoes, um, a lot of pineapple, uh, we have papaya year-round, one thing I'm trying to do, I'm trying to work on more organic fruit. I have an organic produce connection down here, but a lot of my fruit is not organic. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Um, what's your take on greens? Do you try and get some some lettuce and spinach into the diet? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I believe I believe strongly. Like uh, you got to get those greens in there and. Uh, one of the people that I watch on uh, YouTube, she, she pounds that message so much that it's really been in my head more. I'm making, I make lots of green smoothies in the last uh, month or so, um, and I just keep them simple. Most of the time they're just bananas, um, water, and, uh, and spinach or, or kale. Beautiful. Yes. Uh, and then I, then I make it, then I usually, you know, I'll eat fruit all day. I'll eat, eat fruit and juices all day. And then usually I'll make something like a, a big salad, huge salad, or zoodles, or something vegetable-based in the evenings. Nice. Nice. All right, let me right. step back just a little bit, Jack, and if you could go in a little more in depth in terms of this kind of trail you took through the Internet and you reached some YouTube videos, and, it, and once you kind of understood the whole the whole. Uh, the broad aspects of eating this way, it kind of made sense to you pretty rapidly. Uh, would you say that was primarily in terms of health, environment, ethics, or a combination of all those? Um, in the beginning, it was totally it was totally health. Uh, you know, not that I didn't I liked animals, but um, the ethical part of veganism had absolutely nothing to do with it in the beginning. And how about now? Oh yeah. I've done a couple of videos and I've talked about that. Like, um, it didn't take very long where it was, um, you know, just as much about the animals. I mean, I'm not a crusader. You're not going to see. I'm not out in a bunch of groups, and I'm not, you know, I probably don't promote the cause as much as anybody else. But you know, I take it seriously, and um, I've tried to in my life. You know, I don't buy a lot of clothes, but I, you know, I think I've been good. I don't think I've bought any animal products in anything. Any my products. Uh, so yeah. I try to be aware. Yeah. Of, I try to be aware of you know just the animals around me. I've even got ants in my house that I 
make a point of getting them out of the way so I don't kill them when I'm cleaning up. But, <laughs> yes, right. definitely both. Right. Definitely both now. I do feel I, I do consider myself an ethical vegan. Okay. Okay. And, and can you tell us a little just just to go through these three branches? To me, these are like the three primary keys to, to veganism: this health, health, uh, ethics, and environment. And maybe it might be interesting to hear from what you've read and learned along the way. Give us a couple of examples why the vegan diet is superior in terms of health. Um, well, I'll tell you, one of the two of the first people that I got turned on to, well, that's not true, but two of the people that I got turned on to very early in this process that made a lot of sense to me were uh, T. Colin Campbell and Dr. Esselstyn. And... You know, I'm kind of like, I'm a skeptic in the beginning anyway, and, you know, there's a lot of us, I shouldn't be talking, us skippy types on YouTube. So when you're getting your information on YouTube, I can be skeptical sometimes. So when I found guys like, you know, that were just promoting a whole food plant-based diet that had, you know, to me, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I thought I just would see P. Colin Campbell and Dr. Esselstyn as having a little bit more credentials, you know. Yeah, so when yeah. I saw I saw guys that looked like them and had the background of them promoting this lifestyle and speaking about it, you know, in, rever in terms of reversing heart disease and, uh, you know, as far as the China study with turning on and turning off cancer. That book probably had more of an effect on me, um, the China study, than anything to this day that I've seen or read about the vegan lifestyle or about a, just about a plant-based lifestyle. And would you, would you say that having followed this now and kind of worked out pretty much the ideal program for you personally, would you say that your experience is that living this way has been an improvement for your health? Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I kind of, I look at it, you know, only being um, a little less than two and a half years into it, I, um, I fully expect I still have a lot of adjustments to make down the road, you know, a lot of things to learn. But as I hone in on you know, I think where I want to be, oh, yeah, I, I feel absolutely amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And what are some of the things you learned along the way about the ethical aspect of this? Uh, maybe you can share with the viewer some of the things you saw that were particularly disturbing about the animal production industry. I don't know. I think like a lot of other people, I just I probably knew a lot of the things that I've seen now as far as how that how the animals are treated, but I had never really paid attention and really seen. I mean, one of the first I had already gone vegan um, for some time before anybody ever shared and uh, showed me Earthlings. And Earthlings yeah. was yeah. Earthlings. I I didn't watch that more than about fifteen minutes because and I've I've told people before I'm like uh, and you know I. I kind of try to catch the people on the fringe. I try to catch my people that are animal rights people that are really loving animals, but they still eat animal products. And I said, you got to watch this uh, show. I said, because, you know, these, uh, what, it's one thing to take another being's life to eat it or consume it, but it's totally other thing to just have a culture of animals that are just raised in torture for their whole life. You know, I'm not even justifying the killing quickly just to consume them, but when you look at the aspect of um, what is being served through supermarkets, it's torture. You know, it just, it, it just, yeah, I couldn't go back. I, yeah. I can yeah. say this, I could potentially find out things in my life and say, well, the raw maybe, I don't know, is that as important, but I can pretty much say I'm a vegan for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, and All right. also along these lines, what were some of the things you learned about the environmental damage caused by an animal-based industry? You know that I should probably go and look, read more about. I'm not all that. I do know. Um, I, I've seen some. I've seen you know people, what people share. I saw something the other day talking about um, it takes like 220 gallons of water or something to produce a hamburger. I guess they figured out you know all the numbers and stuff on that. So I do know that as far as, I don't know exactly how it all works together, but I do know that if the whole world went vegan, pretty much everybody in the world would eat vegan, would, would be able to eat. And pretty right. much everybody right. in the world would have 
there would be equal resources around. I, you know, I probably sound kind of ignorant in this area, but um, I just know that to produce plant, I mean, animal products and food, it takes an incredible amount of resources. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now, something yeah. you might be able to shed some light on, you know, coming from Alabama, you know, and, and I'm up in Virginia, it's not too different. There's a big hunting culture, you know, and it's like, it's kind of a, there's a strong tradition of that in, in, uh, in especially Southern culture, I think, and really th throughout the United States. Um, how do you, how do you address that? Uh, like, how do you, how do you address what you know now and interacting with, say, family members or other folks in society that have not yet recognized these principles? Well, I don't, you know, like I say, I go back and I kind of disconnected from where I grew up a long time ago. So when I go back, I really only have contact with my mother, even though I'm in the midst of South Alabama. But I have people ask me this all the time. And I just look at it like this. I would rather see, you know, the hunters get picked on a lot. And I think hunting in the South is a lot different than hunting is a lot of other places. Like, I grew up around a lot of people. They weren't trophy hunters. They hunted for meat. Yeah. You know, they, literally, yeah. they literally hunt for meat in the deer seasons and in the turkey season. And they fill their freezers and they eat for the rest of the year. Well, I'd, I'd rather they didn't do that. But I would much rather see, I'd, I'd much rather see that than that same person just getting all their food at the grocery store because even though that animal might feel fear in the moment before it's dying, before it's dead, or sometimes with hunting, you know, you don't get a clean shot or whatever, still that animal wasn't tortured its whole life. So, I mean, in some ways it's a cleaner thing to, you know, you don't feel like you have blood on your hands if you go to the supermarket and get a whole bunch of steak and this and that or, you know, pork chops in there, but yet people tend to demonize the hunter because He's more direct, but in a way, he's more honest because he's out there making the kill, you know, and he's not he's not killing an animal that's just been kept in some little crate for so long. Like I say, I, I would never hunt again. I don't support hunting. I'm not trying to be pro-hunting, but in some ways, I just see it as a much more ethical um, choice than the grocery store. I love that point, Jack. That's a beautiful point. Yeah. Some, in many ways, uh, hunters can be more connected with nature than a lot of folks who are living in the suburbs and shopping at the grocery store. So yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, all right, uh, let's see. I'm going to throw a couple of nutrients at you, and I want you to uh, tell us the conclusions you've reached for yourself on each one. Okay. So the first one is uh, vitamin B12. Vitamin B12, okay, just uh, everything I know about B12 and one quickie. Uh, I, you know, I found out that basically animal, the animals are sort of an intermediary, that B12 is just basically uh, bacteria that comes from the soil. Um, I know that a lot of people blame it on a vegan or a raw diet, but the, the average American is probably deficient in B12. Now, for me, as far as in my two and a half years, I bought a little, uh, excuse me one second, I have it right here. I don't know if you'll actually see it. I was using this for a little while. Okay. okay. It's a spray, and it seems to be a good quality spray. And I've never felt any adverse effects. Now, that ran out. That ran out about eight or nine months ago. Now, I will tell you this, and, and I'm going to go get another one next week. About the 1st of July, I wasn't feeling bad, but I said, you know what? Everybody's always talking about B12, and I'm going to go get a B12 shot. Well, here, we're fortunate. We can just go into the pharmacy and uh, get a lot of the things that we need. So I just went into the pharmacy said, hey, can you give me a B12 shot? And they were like, yeah. And they got it up, gave me the B12 shot. It was 10 bucks. That was it. I was zinging that afternoon. Once I had a little bit of time for it to kind of get in, I was absolutely, so I don't know if I was deficient. I don't know if it was a placebo effect. Um, yeah, yeah. But I just like, it was like you watered a flower. I went, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. It wasn't like I felt bad, had low energy, but this just took me to a different level. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, and uh, this, this next one may not be much of an issue for you because you got plenty of sunshine there, but uh, vitamin D? Oh, yeah. 
I go out, uh, and I was just out yesterday. If the clouds don't come in, I'll probably take a little bit today. I, I try to just go out. I've got a private little backyard. Um, I go out and uh, take about 20 minutes on each side, about whatever I can do. Like sometimes I have more, but I'd say on an average three or four times a week. All right. All right. And um, how about iodine? Do you have any, any interest in that? Or do you try to eat sea vegetables? Um, I, you know, that's something I probably should look into more also. I do from time to time, even though it's not a, and that's something I eat that's probably technically cooked when I'm down here, is I do nori rolls. I don't do them, you know, it's not like they're not a regular on my menu, but I'd say I, I do nori rolls maybe once every couple of weeks or so. Okay. Okay. So that's, uh, that's primarily rice rolled in seaweed? Well, no, I just use the, I don't use the rice, I just use the seaweed. I mean, I just use the nori sheets. Okay. The, the, the seaweed, yeah, and I wrap. I'll usually make like a fake rice of uh, cauliflower or something like that. Okay, gotcha, All right. Um, and what's your take on water? Do you have to drink a lot of water? Whew. Especially down here, yeah. I feel like, um, I feel like I'm never properly hydrated. I'm aware of it and I'm always trying to drink more. And, you know, I drink large amounts of juice during the day, um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm all about water, but it's like I still feel like I'm always trying to play catch-up. I never get there that I really have as much water as I think I should. Okay. And, and, and what about... Yeah, we're talking about, I drink, I mean, even when I, even when I drink 96 ounces, I, I really need to drink plus four times 32, like 128. I feel like that's kind of an optimal amount for me, and I know... And even when I get around 96 ounces of water, I can just tell, you know, I'm not fully hydrated. Wow. What? That's well, amazing. We're, um, we're uh, sweating all the time down here. Okay, okay. And how about uh, sleep? Do you uh, try to get eight hours? Do you have to use an alarm clock? What's, what's your take on sleep? Um, I, use, I use an alarm just on mornings. Uh, sometimes for uh, one of my jobs, I, uh, I shoot surf video on the beach, and if it's a really early morning, I'll set it. But, oh, yeah, I get probably, I get I get a good seven, eight hours of sleep every night. I'm an early night person. I usually, you know, I'm on the computer working, doing what I do all day, and uh, I usually eat dinner, uh, maybe watch a couple of YouTube videos, and hopefully I'm usually asleep by 9, 9.30. All right. All right. So um, one thing I'd like to hear a little more from you on, you kind of went into it, and that is um, what's the best way for folks to share this information with, with people? Now, like, you know, on these YouTube channels, I recently interviewed uh, Barry, uh, what is, I forget his channel at the time, but he was saying, you know, a lot of times it can feel like you're kind of preaching to the choir in this YouTube uh, vegan community. And... Um, I wonder, what's your take on this? And do you have ways of sharing this information with folks? I guess you kind of have to base it on receptivity, but uh, what's your take on this? Well, that's a good question because also um, I'm uh, part of my work is I'm an internet marketer, so I kind of understand the keywording and uh, you know the, the, that practice of trying to get the message out to as many people as possible. And yeah, you're right, and I and I actually play with that. That's why some keywords I, I try to get raw vegan in there because I feel like sometimes the raw vegan people want raw vegan, but I also try to use raw before I try to use cooked vegan at times, just so anybody that it might come across or anybody that might see the video will. I guess I'm trying to appeal to a wider audience. But yeah, because what yeah. you're asking is a really good question because you know. Are we only talking to other hardcore people or extreme people like ourselves? Um, so I kind of try to, you know, make, I don't want to water down the message, but I try to make it very inclusive. Like I did a video this weekend, and uh, I think it's still uploading, where I just talked about pulling people in little by little. If we talk to all vegan, they're going to they're gonna think, they think you're an alien or something. Even vegan sounds really extreme, but if you start just approaching them and talking about eating more of a whole food plant-based diet, 
that's not so radical, that's not so scary. You're just kind of making that suggestion, you know, why don't you get more fruits and vegetables into your diet? And I think it's kind of like a pulling them in little by little. If you can start cleaning people up a little bit or just giving them a little bit of knowledge for them to try and they start feeling a little bit better, you know, you can get them deeper and deeper. That's great. I love that. And um, if you're in a situation like, uh, like you wouldn't mind going out to dinner with folks that eat meat, right? You wouldn't, like, uh, maybe, it sounds like you got have kind of a solitary life there, so maybe that doesn't happen that, that frequently. But, uh, like, if you go home and you said you're pretty much with your mom, I guess, so maybe you don't have much opportunity for this. But what I'm getting at is uh, how can the message be communicated to folks who, who don't really, who, who think this is outlandish? To, to meet based folks, you know, who are, have, have no idea what we're talking about. Um, like I said, I think it's just you introduce it step by step, like you maybe, you know, you try to suggest adding more fruits and vegetables and cutting back on the meat. You know, yeah. if you yeah. can, you know I think it, I was talking to a new friend a couple of weeks ago. I actually met my first raw vegans in person a couple of weeks ago in Alabama. And we were talking about something, and he put, put a point that I've been, it's been stuck in my head. There's, there's good, there's better, and then there's best. You know, if we, can, if we can get people, I mean, yeah, we'd prefer if they didn't eat meat and dairy and they really got healthy, but still, even if tomorrow they eat more fruits and vegetables than they ate today, or they add some to their diet, they're better off than they were, and that's better than nothing. In the same way with excluding things from their diet, even if they, even if they do a meatless Monday, or even if they cut their meat from every day to three or four days a week, it's yeah. still an improvement. And that improve, you know, sometimes people are so black and white; it's all or nothing. And um, and I just like to see it as a way, you know, like we can. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. We can benefit people even if they're not ready for the full program, and if we can. Just get them a little bit healthier. They may go a little bit further down the rabbit hole. Love it, love it. Very practical. All right. Um, this went by pretty quick, Jack. Uh, do you have any like broad tips you give to someone who's considering transitioning to this way of life? Wow, any tips? Um, I guess just you know to educate themselves as much as possible. And to keep an open mind. I mean, I always, I mean, there's just, you know, don't, don't, uh, hook on to one philosophy within this, uh, health world, raw world, vegan movement and be, just be like that, have your blinders on, you know. I feel like I'm always learning things and I feel that, um, that just having an open mind has been the biggest, the biggest, um, help for me where I haven't had prejudices set in my head. You know, I'm willing to try new things, I'm willing to tweak my diet, and I'm willing to learn from anybody. I'm not, I kind of try to, I try to be a humble person. I feel like we can learn from everybody out there. So I would just say keep educating yourself and be willing to try and, and be instinctive. Listen to your body. Because, um, you know, people use these words, gurus and the raw food and vegan leaders out there, but in the end, nobody knows my body my body better than I do, and the same with you, and the same with anybody, so one of the biggest things, you have to learn to listen to your body and develop that intuition for yourself, because I don't believe that intuition will um, steer you wrong. Even sometimes when people, I'm not the most scientific guy, and people will bring out science, and they'll be like, well, you shouldn't do this because of blah, 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 and I'm like, well, you may know what you're talking about, but I'm gonna, I can't listen to science over the way that I feel. That's a great that point, right. Jack. I love that. I love that point. Um, I think some of these concepts of, you know, like a species-specific diet and, you know, being biologically oriented towards a, a specific diet, I, there's, that's always resonated for me intellectually. It makes a lot of sense. And yet, we have this huge, complex, uh, global uh, population that has a lot of variations in it that affect where they are on that timeline of, of dietary adjustment and th there's so many factors that go into it to just say everybody should be eating all raw 100% today it just it just is not going to work I, I think oh absolutely but, yeah 
But um, all right. And Jack, can you tell the the viewers um, you've got a YouTube channel uh, and and any other references that where they can find your your stuff at? Yeah, I would say probably the YouTube channel is the best to find. It's got all my um, I forget what everything's named on the others. Um, it's got all my social media buttons on there. So if they go to the YouTube channel, which is under Jack Albritton, they can find. Um, I've got a website, and I need to get back to writing, but I'm just, I enjoy the video process so much, I haven't written in there in a while. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say, yeah, just, pick, I would say catch me through the, um, through the YouTube channel. Okay. Okay. And uh, one other thing, since you're down there, you know, uh, there's a lot of folks down there that do, like, fasting and raw food, like, I, I know Lauren Lockman's down there, and... Uh, Doug Graham does some stuff down there. Do you ever hear about these guys? Are you near any of them? Uh, um, I've heard about them in passing. Uh, I don't. I'm not real familiar with art with where they are. I've looked at a couple of their um, of their. Oh, I've looked at their websites, and I'm not. I'm still not sure exactly where they are in Costa Rica. Okay. There's there's one lady that's down in Manuel Antonio. I'm in a little beach town called Playa Jaco. J A C O. She's in Manuel Antonio, and it's called the Epic Life Center. Amber, her name is Amber's. Now, I, I wasn't familiar with her, but apparently she's a big wig in the, in the raw vegan and the yoga world, and she does some programs down there. Okay. okay. But I've actually, I haven't really, that was my background. I used to do vacations. I, I have plans in the in the future for doing uh, raw vegan uh, vacations down here and doing yoga vacations down here but the reason I haven't moved forward and done any more on that right now is I just to be honest I think the raw retreats and all that raw thing everywhere in the world it's kind of elitism and it's kind of expensive so the thing that's been holding me back is I was not going to relaunch my travel business until I had something available for everybody. You know what I mean? In other words, I don't have a problem with doing a fancy retreat or doing a fancy uh, vacation because I have access to, you know, fabulous houses and fabulous accommodations. But I also want that, that I want that person that's just on a shoestring budget, you know, to be able to come down and do it too. So I love that, Jack. I, I really like that. You know, I can remember. Um, I worked at a health food store like 20, 30 years ago, and I was working with a girl there, and, and one day she said to me, you know, vegetarianism, it's only for rich people. <laughs> and uh, your comment, it's reminded me of that, and, and uh, yeah, I, I really like what you're saying. It, it's, it's, actually, it should be more economical to live this way. So, uh, and it, it is down here. I'll tell you, I could, um, Costa Rica's gotten a little bit more expensive in the 15 years I've been here, and I find it much cheaper to eat my lifestyle than if I still ate the way that I used to. Yeah. All right, well, Jack, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, I appreciate it. I enjoyed doing it. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be watching your videos with interest. Cool. And where can, can maybe you can just send this to me in my, in our email exchange? Where your channel is, or your or your website? Yeah, my yeah. YouTube channel is yeah. Raw and Cooked Vegan. Okay. And I interview interview folks like yourself who are vegan. And if you have any vegan friends that would be up for it, you know, send them my way. Uh, basic. The idea behind this is just to uh, it's to kind of personalize veganism. You know, there's there's so many folks doing it, and we can all learn from each other and, and our experiences, and and also uh, it's an attempt to kind of uh, uh, create an umbrella. Sometimes it, it felt like the raw movement and the and the cooked vegan movement were ha having some uh, barriers between each other, and I, I I want all vegans to work together. I, to me, the big the big picture is shifting the broader animal based culture to veganism. That's really what I'm into. So it's kind of learning. I, I love what you're saying, being open-minded. There's things we can learn from the raw vegan movement. There are things we can learn from the cooked vegan movement. Uh, a general point being that veganism, whatever flag it flies under, is better than an animal-based diet. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's my major interest.
But I too have a, a website, rawandcookedvegan.com, where I've, I, they're basically just links to a lot of the videos I've done on the YouTube channel. So, um, and then I, I just started a new channel. It's, it's called uh, Advaita Bhakti and, and Seva. And uh, it's going to be interviews with folks who are not necessarily vegan, but have had a lot of, uh, let's say, spiritual experience. Um, so that, that should be fun. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, that sounds nice. I'm, I'm going to definitely, I'm always looking for a new YouTube channel. You're probably going to be my, uh, I'm being kind of lazy today, so I'll probably watch quite a few of your uh, videos later this afternoon. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. It's, uh, it's great. And um, do you have some videos on your channel about how you, how you did this? Because I think it's fascinating that you've created your own life and you've been, it sounds like you've been very... Uh, free in the way you've created this business, and I guess have you done some videos about that? Because that's I'm sure people would love to hear about that. Um, I haven't really done any. I've I've kind of told my story of you know where I was right before I went um, all vegan. Um, I don't really have a great story for how I made it to Costa Rica. I was just kind of bumming around and found my way here. Um, I'm kind of holding off on the. I haven't really, I've alluded to it in a few videos, I haven't really uh, talked about doing the vacations yet, I just figured I would get the website a little further along and get some of the concepts put together before I talked about that, so I really haven't done a video on on that aspect of it yet. Well, you know, t uh, filming folks surfing in the morning in Costa Rica sounds like a pretty kick-ass job. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad at all. <laughs> All right. Well, Jack, it's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, I'll look forward to talking to you in the future. Oh, very nice. I sure it was very nice doing the interview with you, Paul. I appreciate it. All right, my friend. Take care. All right. Have a good afternoon. You too.